Hey everybody, Dr. O here, and welcome to Unit 9, the unit on the nervous system. So we're going to start by talking about the brain. And in the adult brain, we're going to have four distinct regions. Uh, the large region that we tend to think of when we think of the brain is known as the cerebrum. So that is this big squiggly looking part right here. All of this actually right through here. And then inside of the brain, like deep inside, <clears throat> there's going to be this um, structure right in here known as the diencephalon and there's some parts to this we'll be learning about. So this is inside which is why it's kind of a faded appearance but this is the diencephalon so this is an inner structure inside the brain. And then we have the brain stem which we see here in green and there's three parts to the, the brain stem. Up here at the top we have the midbrain and then this rounded part here is the pons. And then this lower part right through here is the medulla oblongata. And then this little squiggly part underneath here, this is known as the cerebellum. So the four major parts of the brain are the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebrum. Oh, excuse me, cerebellum. <laughs> I'll get it out. Um, and then we have some other structures within that. We've listed out the other structures in the brainstem. We did not list out the other structures of the diencephalon. We'll get to that in a little bit. Now the cerebellum is going to be broken up into a right and a left half. These are called hemispheres and these are going to be the most superior part of the brain and it's going to account for most of the brain by mass, upwards of 83%. Now when we look at the surface, we're going to notice that it has these, these areas that kind of poke up. Uh, we call those ridges. They're actually a very large rounded ridge and those are called gyri. If we're talking about one, it's a gyrus. And then the dippyennies or the little shallow grooves, those are known as the sulci. And if we're talking about just one, it's a sulcus. So if we look at the image, we can see this uh, line right here is pointing to this gyrus, and then this line right here is pointing to this sulcus. All right. Now we have deeper grooves that are known as fissures, and we have a couple that we want you to know about. One is known as the longitudinal fissure, and that runs in the, the sagittal uh, plane, the, the mid-sagittal plane of the brain, and it divides the, the cerebrum into the left and right hemispheres. It doesn't run all the way through. There's still an attachment point that holds the two hemispheres together, but it is a very deep groove. goes all the way down to that inner structure known as the corpus callosum. And then we have the transverse cerebral fissure, which is going to separate the cerebrum from the cerebellum. So this image on the right is a coronal view of the brain. So we've taken away the anterior aspect and we're looking at what's left in the posterior aspect. And we can see that right here we have a really deep groove and that is going to be the longitudinal fissure. And we're going to, uh, as a result, end up getting the, um, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. While we're looking at this picture, I also want to point out that on the outer portions of this this uh, image here, this darker colored uh, substance, this is known as gray matter. And you might remember from the lecture that gray matter is going to be unmyelinated, unmyelinated neurons and neuron parts. So here we're going to have cell bodies, and dendrites, and then maybe some unmyelinated inner neurons. And that the rest of this, this white part, this is going to be myelinated neuron parts, which is going to be those um, axons. And then we have some regions that are also unmyelinated. There's different nuclei, things like that in here. But I just wanted to point out where we're going to see the gray matter and where we're going to see the white matter and what each of those is. Oh, and before I leave, <clears throat> here's the transverse fissure that's dividing the um, cerebrum from the cerebellum right here. And then we also have a lateral sulcus, not as deep as a fissure. This is a this is the sulcus right here, right there. And the lateral sulcus is between a couple of lobes of the brain, and there's actually another lobe that we can visualize right in there. Now I'm done. So in this image, we're starting to get uh, our first introduction to the lobes 
of the of the cerebrum and we have this anterior lobe in pink this is known as the frontal lobe and then we've got this dark turquoise blue this is um, known as the parietal lobe it's not labeled back here light blue this is the occipital lobe and then this dark navy blue this is the temporal lobe and there is a sulcus that divides the temporal lobe and largely the frontal lobe and if we pull these two lobes apart um, <clears throat> what we see down deep in the uh, lateral sulcus is going to be this additional lobe known as the insula so this is a, our first pass at looking at the different lobes of the cerebrum and um, some of the the uh, sulci associated with that now if we were to remove one half of the hemispheres this is what we would see we would see half of the brain and definitely see the cerebrum right through here and the cerebellum through there and we get our first real clear glimpse of the diencephalon and then of the brainstem and like I said you have that longitudinal fissure that is dividing the cerebrum into left and half right uh, uh, left and half left and uh, right halves but there's still an attachment point and the attachment point is deep inside the brain and this right here this corpus callosum is the attachment point so the corpus callosum is what holds the cerebrum together so that it's not truly two distinct halves it's just um, a, a, a large upper region of brain mass that has a very deep divide in it that gives the appearance of it being two separate structures it's not really separate so the corpus callosum is that connection between the two halves the two hemispheres it is uh, communication so there are neurons that are passing from the left hemisphere to the right and from the right into the left so there's some integration that is that's happening as a result of um, the, the corpus callosum uh, we see another structure associated midline and this um, is kind of a continuation of the corpus callosum but we would call it um, the fornix and it extends from the hippocampus which is another structure found deep in this region of the brain uh, into the diencephalon this is part of the limbic system and the limbic system is largely in charge of our cognition our memory our emotions and our sexual response so a moment ago we looked at a picture of the brain where we saw the cerebrum colored in these different um, shades of blue and this pink and I pointed out the different lobes that we have here so I'm going to go through this and on the next slide they, they are actually labeled for you so here we've got the frontal lobe here in pink the parietal lobe is this uh, turquoise color the temporal lobe is this dark navy blue occipital lobe is here in back and it's the light blue and the insula we can't see in this image because we'd actually have to pull the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe apart to look at the insula which is deep to this lateral sulcus which is actually it within the lateral sulcus all right now if you'll notice the names of these lobes are closely aligned with the bones of the cranium that overlie these regions of the brain so the frontal bone overlies the pink region the parietal lobe pri I mean the parietal lobe um, is not nearly as big as the parietal bones but the parietal bones do overlie that region that we see in back occiput does overlie the light blue region we see in back and the temporal lobe does overlie the, the navy blue region so um, hopefully you find that at least a little bit helpful when remembering the names of the cerebral hemispheres so one more time going to label these out the pink one is the frontal lobe the turquoise is the parietal lobe the light blue is the occipital lobe and the navy blue is the temporal lobe and then deep in here would be the um, deep in the lateral sulcus right here would be the insula 
Now you might wonder, how do they know where the frontal lobe starts and, and stops and where the parietal lobe starts and stops? Well, there's a couple of sulci that are prominent and uh, can be easily seen on every brain, um, even without the colors. Uh, pink and turquoise, we can actually see these. And one of these is this sulcus that runs right along the coronal plane right through here. And this one is known as the central sulcus. The central sulcus is the division between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And on either side of this groove is going to be a gyrus that we know um, what functions it 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 does. So you, you're also going to need to know that in back of the central sulcus, you're going to have this gyrus right here. And in front of the central sulcus, you're going to have this gyrus right here. The gyrus in back is known as the post-central gyrus because it is in back of the central sulcus. So it is post-central, but it's a gyrus, not a sulcus, which is why we call it a gyrus. And then the one in front would be the pre-central gyrus. So it's in front of the central sulcus. So you'll be learning a little bit about what these um, two uh, gyri, uh, what functions they house. You'll also be learning a little bit about what functions are housed here. And then we'll be learning some other things about the frontal lobe and um, as we get into this. Now the diencephalon was that purple region found deep inside the brain, kind of sitting on top of the brain stem. And what we see in the diencephalon are three paired gray matter structures. So gray matter tells us that we don't have myelination here, which means that we must have a bunch of uh, inner neurons and uh, cell bodies. So the three regions of the, of the diencephalon all have thalamus in the name. So one is just known as thalamus. One is known as the hypothalamus, which means it must be somewhere underneath the thalamus. And then we have the epithalamus, which means that it's somewhere above the thalamus. So let's take a look at where all three of the thalamus uh, clan is located. So the thalamus is going to be this very rounded egg-shaped region right here. And it's uh, bilateral, so there's two of these located in the brain, one in the left hemisphere, one in the right. And it's also going to be a little bit above the um, third ventricle. Now, I know we haven't studied ventricles yet, but <clears throat> when we get there, that'll make sense. And this is the largest structure of the diencephalon. Now, nuclei project and receive fibers from the cerebral cortex here in the thalamus. So the thing that we can say, based upon that statement right there, is that the thalamus is very much like Grand Central Station when it comes to information coming in and out of the brain. So when information is coming up from the spinal cord, it's going to enter into the cranial vault, travel through the brain stem, and then it will have projections that are going to go to the thalamus. And there are nuclei located there. And you might remember that nuclei in the, it are um, clusters of cell bodies found in the brain. And when that information that's coming in from the afferent pathways uh, synapses with those nuclei, the, the thalamus determines where are all the places that that information should be sent within the brain. So the thalamus is like a big relay station. We could think of it as a, a, a train station where information is coming in and then other information has to be sent out. So the thalamus is that big um, you know, tra uh, dissemination center. That's a good way to put that. All right. So it receives information coming in from afferent pathways. Um, it will figure out where all that information needs to go. And um, in order for the brain to uh, um, uh, interpret that information and develop plans of action. Now the hypothalamus, as the name implies, is going to be located below the thalamus. It's kind of in front and below. And um, it has a feature known as the infundibulum, which is kind of a projection off of the hypothalamus. And it's going to connect the hypothalamus with an endocrine gland known as the pituitary. We don't study the pituitary or any of the endocrine glands in AMP1, but we will in AMP2. Now, 
the hypothalamus is part of the endocrine system, even though it's part of the brain, and it does make some hormones, um, and um, it is a chief control center when it comes to um, maintaining um, homeostasis in the body. And the sorts of things that the hypothalamus is in charge of um, coordinating and controlling are things like blood pressure, the rate and force of the digestive tract motility, the movement of the digestive tract. Uh, pupillary size is regulated here. Um, it also uh, initiates physical responses to emotions. Um, it regulates our, our body temperature, so we actually have a little thermostat located in there that helps us keep our body temperature regulated. Um, it helps us engage cooling mechanisms when we, when we get too hot and engage mechanisms to keep us warm when we're too cold. It also is where we find the thirst centers, the hunger center, and where we basically modulate our sleep and wake cycles. So the hypothalamus, even though it's a really small portion of the brain, is really important to our existence, in part because it does so much to ensure appropriate balance in the body. Now the last of the thalamus brothers is, is uh, the uh, epithalamus, and this is the most dorsal or posterior portion of the diencephalon, um, and this is where we're going to see the pineal gland. And um, the pineal gland secretes melatonin, which helps us regulate our sleep and wake cycles. And um, that's about all we're really going to say about that. Now, it shouldn't come as a surprise that we're going to have some special covers on our brain and spinal cord, and uh, indeed we do, and these are called meninges. So the meninges are, are going to cover and protect the central nervous system structures, which, are, which is going to be the brain and the spinal cord. They protect blood vessels that are associated with these structures, and they enclose what are called the venous sinuses. Venous sinuses are important in returning fluid back into the bloodstream and returning blood to the bloodstream as it goes to the circulation um, in the central nervous system. Uh, it's going to contain the cerebral spinal fluid, and it helps form par partitions within the skull, kind of supports the, the different regions that we see uh, on the brain. The meninges is a rather complex structure. It actually consists of three layers. The outermost layer is called the dura mater. There's a middle layer called the arachnoid mater. And then there's an inner layer called the pia mater. So let's take a look at each one of these. So let me tell you what you're looking at in this image. So we're right at the top of the head, and here is, let's say, the uh, left hemisphere, here's the right hemisphere, and then we have the layers of the meninges, and then we get into the skull, and then we get into the skin. So starting from the outer layer working in, we've got the skin on the top of the head, and then we're going to have a periosteum, which is going to go around whatever cranial bone this is, probably a parietal bone, given that we're right on the top of the head. And then if we have a periosteum on this side, of course we're going to have a periosteum on this side. But the thing about the periosteum on the inside is that it is going to merge with the uh, meninges, the inner um, the inner covering of the brain, the outer, I should say, the outer covering of the inner covering of the brain. So it's the outermost layer of the, the meninges. It's going to merge with that, that uh, inner periosteum, and that's what creates the dura mater. Now, the, the term dura mater actually means tough mother, and that describes this tissue. Because this, um, this meningeal layer <clears throat> is merged with the periosteum, it's really, really tough. Okay, so that's where it gets its name. Now, the, it, the, next, <clears throat> the next innermost layer is called the arachnoid mater, and this actually means spider mother. And the reason why it's called this is that if we look in this layer right here, we see all these little kind of cobwebby strands that are creating um, this layer. Now, it comes off of this this layer right here. So we got this layer, then we got these cobwebby projections to the um, inner, inner, innermost layer, which is known as the pia mater. And that is why it's called the arachnoid mater. There's a fair amount of space here, enough space that we can run blood vessels. So we kind of need that space there, and those little cobwebby strands provide that for us.
Now the innermost layer is the layer of the Menendez that lays right on top of the brains, very much like a visceral layer of uh, any hollow cavity that we've learned about that lays on top of the organ. So the pia mater is very much like a, like a visceral layer. It lays right on top of the brain. It kind of covers the brain and follows it into all of these little sulci and down into the, um, the fissures. And um, um, yeah, that's our innermost layer. So those are the three uh, meninges of the brain. So this slide is putting all of that together. So the dura mater is going to actually be made up of the periosteal layer um, on the inside of the skull as well as the meningeal layer. And it's going to be uh, separated from the arachnoid layer by the subdural space. So there is a little space in between there. They're not just these, these two layers are not merged together. That is the two layers of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. There's a space there. The arachnoid mater, as I said, has these spider web-like extensions that are going to create this space. The space is where we're going to see the cerebral spinal fluid in our blood vessels. Um, it is in this area where we're going to absorb the cerebral spinal fluid and return it to the blood because we haven't said this yet, but cerebral spinal fluid is actually made from blood plasma. So there are special cells in the ventricles, which are the open areas of the brain that are going to um, uh, receive plasma, clean it up, and turn it into cerebral spinal fluid. All right. um, the arachnoid mater is distinct from the pia mater by way of the subarachnoid space. And then the innermost layer is the pia mater, and this clings tightly to the brain. It follows every convolution, which means that it goes down into the sulci, even down into the longitudinal fissure, like what we see right here. And it's going to contain tiny blood vessels. That are, speeding, um, that are feeding and supplying the neurons and um, glial cells of the brain tissue. Now, as I said a moment ago, cerebral spinal fluid is going to be that fluid that is created by the ependymal cells um, that, of the, lining the ventricles. And um, the whole function of the cerebral spinal fluid is that it forms like a liquid cushion around the brain, because remember the brain is largely made up of fat, and fat's going to float in a liquid environment. And um, that combination of myelin in the brain and fluid surrounding it allows the, the brain to kind of float, eases some of the weight of the brain off of the brain stem, and um, allows it to be suspended in this fluid. So it gives buoyancy to the, the, the brain. Um, it helps protect the, the brain from blows and trauma to the head because it kind of acts like a, like a buffer or a bumper. And uh, the fluid acts as a medium to provide nourishment and chemical signals, um, chemical messengers rather, uh, to the brain tissues. So cerebral spinal fluid is made up of a watery solution that contains um, uh, ions and um, maybe a little bit of protein, but not very much. So like I said, it gets created from blood plasma, the fluid component of blood, but the ependymal cells that line the ventricles are going to pull out most of the proteins and um, create an, an ion population that is specific to cerebral spinal fluid, a little bit different than what we see in plasma. So where are the ependymal cells of the ventricles getting access to plasma? Well, they're getting access to plasma by way of this special little cluster of tiny blood vessels known as the choroid plexus. So uh, we see a choroid plexus in the roof of each ventricle. It gets enclosed by the pia mater and is surrounded by these ependymal cells. And the thing about capillaries, I know we haven't talked about that yet, but capillaries are tiny blood vessels that are designed to be weepy. They're designed to be leaky. So when blood gets into these little capillary beds, in this case the choroid plexus, it's going to spill out fluids. It's going to spill out uh, other things as well, like maybe um, some ions, maybe some nutrients, things like that, um, because that's, that's the whole purpose of, of capillaries. And what happens when that happens here at the choroid plexus, the ependymal cells are going to take that, uh, that fluid and alter the composition a little bit, clean it up, and turn it into cerebral spinal fluid.
right? And then the cilia of the ependymal cells is going to help move that cerebral spinal fluid through the, the different um, ventricles that we see in the brain and then through the, the central canal that runs through the spinal cord. Um, normal amount of cerebral spinal fluid in an adult is about 150 milliliters and it gets replaced every eight hours. Now I have been in programs where they said that the purpose of cerebral spinal fluid was to cleanse and cool the brain. But when your turnover rate is eight hours, there is no cooling going on there because after eight hours, that cerebral spinal fluid is going to be every bit as warm as you are and it won't have the capacity to cool the brain any longer. So I would not say that that is a, a, a function of cerebral spinal fluid, but I would say that it does cleanse the brain and it provides um, a medium for nutrients and signaling molecules. That I would absolutely say. Now leading up to this slide, I've been talking about ventricles and I've said that the ventricles are these open areas that we have in, in the brain. And the thing about these open areas is that they're all interconnected and they're all going to be filled with cerebral spinal fluid and they're all lined with ependymal cells. So how many ventricles do we have? Well, we actually have four. So we're going to start by talking about the lateral ventricles. We have one on the left and we have one on the right. And these are going to be uh, C-shaped chambers. They're located deep in each of the hemispheres. So here's two of our four. These two will merge with the third ventricle, which lies in the diencephalon. And uh, the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles are connected by way of a structure known as the interventricular foramen. And then our fourth ventricle, which we're going to see in the brain, lies in the hind brain. So it's like in, in back of the brain. Um, it actually is in, in front of the cerebellum. It's continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. And the fourth ventricle is going to be connected to the third ventricle by way of a structure called the cerebral aqueduct. So I'm sure I have a picture on the next slide. So let's go to the next slide and take a look. So here we have an anterior view of the brain and then a lateral view of the brain, left lateral view. So the anterior brain is here and the posterior brain is here. Now, here are the two C-shaped lateral ventricles occupying each of the hemispheres. So this is what they look like when we're looking at them head on. They're kind of like a, like a ram's horn. You know, a ram's horn attached to the head and then it curls um, forward and, and then back and around and curls around like that. If we look at the lateral ventricles from the side, we get a slightly different perspective here. All right. But we can see that they're rather large. So there's our lateral ventricles. Now, if we're moving out of the lateral ventricles left and right, we're going to move through a little tiny region known as the interventricular foramen in order to get into the third ventricle. Now, if we're looking at it from the anterior view, the third ventricle doesn't look like much, but if we look at it from the lateral view, it looks a little bit like a chicken head. So there's a beak of the chicken, the eye, head feathers kind of like right there. So we get the chicken head third ventricle. Up here is the interventricular foramen that's attaching it to the two lateral ventricles. And if we follow the third ventricle down, right through here is a cerebral aqueduct. And then we get into the fourth ventricle. The sort of kite-shaped structure is the fourth ventricle. And it's located anterior to our buddy, the cerebellum, right there. Actually, I think it's in front of, yeah, it's in front of the cerebellum right there. If we look at it from the side view, it doesn't look like much. It's kind of flat. There's our fourth ventricle right there. Right. But if we follow it on down inferiorly, we're going to see that it goes into the spinal cord. It's continuous with the spinal cord. And it's going to create what's known as the central canal. Central canal. So those are the ventricles and the connecting points of the ventricles in the brain leading down into the central canal of the spinal cord. So moving on into the brain stem, 
we've already learned that the brain stem is made up of three distinct regions. We have the upper midbrain, we have the middle pons, and then we have um, the medulla oblongata, which is the last little portion of that before it becomes the spinal cord. Now, it's largely, the, the, the brain stem is very similar to the spinal cord, but it contains nuclei, those clusters of cell bodies found in the central nervous system. And um, the brain stem largely controls many autonomic, uh, not autonomic, but automatic behaviors necessary for life. Things like uh, breathing and heart, managing heart rate, uh, managing blood pressure, things like that. It contains fiber tracts, which remember are clusters of axons um, that connect <clears throat> the higher and the lower neural centers. So it's um, kind of a passageway as well as um, a relay station. And uh, the nuclei are going to largely be associated with the 12, with 10 of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So when we when we get to the cranial nerves, the thing that you'll notice is that many of the cranial nerves are merging, or not merging, but emerging from the um, the brainstem. So um, even though it's just because you know many people are like, oh, it's just the brainstem, it, it's a pretty vital structure as far as our survival and our function go. So you might remember from a previous image, this purple structure right here, this was the um, thalamus, and then we have the hypothalamus, and then in back we would have uh, the epithalamus, which we can't visualize. So this is the diencephalon, and then just underneath the diencephalon is going to be the midbrain. So here's the midbrain right there, midbrain. Now the midbrain is, um, like I said, between the diencephalon and the structure below it, which is known as the pons. Uh, the cerebral aqueduct um, is going to be found in this region posterior, posteriorly. And there are a couple of landmarks that we want you to know about. And these are these little um, knobby projections in back. You've got a couple of um, ones up top here and a couple down the bottom. And these are called the colliculi. So you have a, a pair of superior colliculi, and then you have a pair of inferior colliculi. So there's a colliculus on the left and, and then the one on the right, um, upper and lower. Um, so there's four of these colliculi, two uppers, two lowers. So what's the big deal about these colliculi? Well, the superior colliculi are responsible for our visual reflexes. So this is where we're gonna find the visual reflexes, um, the, the center for those. The inferior colliculi are associated with auditory relay centers. So not reflexes, but just kind of a relay station for processing our auditory information. So we just got through finishing uh, this talking about the uh, midbrain and right below this is the pons. Now the pons is going to be located between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata, which is located below it. The fourth ventricle is going to separate the pons from the cerebellum. So the fourth ventricle is going to be in back of the brainstem, uh, in back specifically of the pons of the brainstem. Uh, we're going to have nuclei that are located here that are part of the reticular formation. Um, and we also have a couple of nuclei that play a role in setting um, our breathing rhythm and rate. So there's a little bit of breathing process that happens here. All right. Now the reticular formation, we could think of that as the part of our brain that helps filter out unnecessary non-critical information. And you might be thinking, well, what kind of information is that? Well, um, think about, you know, your foundation garments, your underwear, your bra, your socks. Um, are you consciously aware of those pressing against your skin? And the answer is no. And that's in large part because the reticular activating system has the ability to help you filter out non-important information, which then leaves your resources available to contend with important information such as you know what's happening around you in the environment what's happening in if you're sitting in class what's the instructor saying um, you know how, how how are you feeling you know does your stomach hurt something like that so that's kind of what we can attribute to the reticular formation now the third and the last structure of the brainstem is the medulla oblongata sometimes just referred to as the medulla and this blends into the spinal cord at the foramen magnum. So once the 
this structure reaches the foramen magnum, which is that large hole in the bottom of the skull, and it goes past that, then we call it spinal cord. All right. Um, this is where we're going to see the, the fourth ventricle. This is where we're going to see the uh, choroid plexus that helps form cerebral spinal fluid. And it is from this moment on that we're going to see that a central canal penetrating and running through the middle of the spinal cord. Now you notice I haven't mentioned anything about what the medulla does. And that's because the medulla does a lot. And those things are listed on the next slide. So the medulla oblongata is such an important structure that just listing a few of the things that it does requires its own slide. So what is the medulla doing for us? Well, it's a, um, an autonomic reflex center. So many functions that are um, happening over in the hypothalamus actually get um, uh, mapped over to the medulla as well. So things that are having to do, for example, with uh, blood pressure management and um, uh, managing uh, solute levels in the blood um, have a component over here as well as in the hypothalamus. So there's a, a number of, of those sorts of things as well as some reflexes that map over here as well. We have a cardiovascular center that's located here in the medulla oblongata and it's going to help us with the force of heart contractions as well as the rate of heart contractions. It helps regulate that. So if the heart needs to ramp up and beat faster and harder, that happens here. If it needs to slow down and, and beat a little more gently and slower, that happens here as well. The, the uh, constriction and dilation of blood vessels is also regulated here, and that's actually closely tied in with the cardiac center. That's why we call this region of, uh, of the medulla the cardiovascular center, because um, if we're trying to get the heart to beat faster uh, and harder, it's, prop it's most likely because we're trying to maintain blood pressure, and the blood vessels can play a role in helping maintain blood pressure pressure by uh, constricting. So they reduce their diameter and that will help maintain blood pressure, at least as far as the heart's concerned and, and some of the important um, blood vessels around the heart and um, the ones going up into the brain. And that's really what we're concerned about. In life or death situations, we're not as worried about the big toe as we are about the heart continuing to pump and the brain continuing to function. So <laughs> that's a little bit about that. Um, we also have some other things happening or uh, being regulated here in the medulla. Uh, for example, the vomit reflex is located here, as is the hiccuping reflex. Our swallowing reflex occurs here. Um, coughing, we actually have uh, irritants, uh, receptors that can pick up irritants in the air um, and uh, pick up noxious chemicals, and that can cause us to um, reflexively cough. Uh, as well as sneeze. So many of our reflexes are located here in the medulla oblongata. The last structure we're going to talk about is the cerebellum. And this is um, uh, that little part that's tucked in back of the cerebrum in, in back. So it's located in back of the pons and the medulla in back of the, the fourth ventricle as well. And it's going to process input from the cortex of the brain as well as the brain stem and some sensory receptors, uh, receptors out in the body. And what, what it's doing is it's taking that information and it's coordinating it to help us create precise coordinated movements of our skeletal muscle. So the fact that you can get up and do the cha-cha is largely due to a cerebellum that's working correctly. It also plays a major role in balance. Um, the cerebellum, very much like the cerebrum, has areas of gray matter and white matter. But the interesting thing about the cerebellum is that the interplay between the gray matter and the white matter create this distinct pattern that looks like a tree with branches and leaves on the branches, as well as a little bit of a root system. And so that interplay of gray matter and white matter is known as the arbor vitae. Arbor means tree. And vitae means life. So it's the tree of life located in our cerebellum. So just to get you oriented, this is the brainstem right here. So we've got the midbrain, the pons, and the uh, medulla oblongata. 
and we see the uh, fourth ventricle right here and then this is the cerebellum and they've done a little bit of a cutaway so that you can see the interplay between the white matter and the gray matter and if you turn your head and tip it so that it uh, your ear is close to your right shoulder you can kind of get the idea that that looks a little bit like a tree hence the name arbor vitae Now the spinal cord is also part of the central nervous system and the cord itself is going to be enclosed within a loop of bone found on the back side of the vertebra and um, that's going to be the, the canal that the spinal cord is in. The spinal cord begins at the foramen magnum found up in the occiput up uh, at the floor of the cranial vault and it's going to end at the level of L1 or L2 so that's the vertebra uh, the first or second vertebra in the lumbar region and there's a reason why uh, the cord stops there now the 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 neurolog neurological tissue continues beyond that point but it's no longer a cord so we have to learn what sort of structure we're looking at um, beyond L1 to L2 uh, or L2. Now the spinal cord is also going to have the three layers of meninges that we learned about in the uh, that cover the brain that we learned about just a few moments ago um, and in between each layer we're going to see cerebral spinal fluid. So uh, we'll have a pia mater that lays directly on the cord, a subarachnoid mater that is the middle layer, and then a dura mater. All right. Um, when we think about what the spinal cord is doing for us, it's providing a two-way communication to and from the brain and the body. Now, it's not just simply a pass-through. There are certain decisions that get made at the spinal level, and these are mostly reflexes. Um, but uh, generally, we could say that that is what the spinal cord is, is, is a, um, um, a two-way communication between the brain and the body. All right, so what we're looking at here is a cross-section of a spinal cord within a vertebra. And this is the vertebral body, so this is the anterior part of the uh, vertebra. And then back here is the uh, spinous process, the lamina, and the transverse processes right here. And within this open area right here is where the spinal cord is going to travel. And they've got listed for you the three layers. So the pia mater lays directly on the spinal cord. And then we have an arachnoid mater. And then there's going to be a dura mater. And we can see that we have branches um, coming off the front and then uh, coming into the back. And these are the spinal nerves that are exiting and entering at this level and having their interface with the cord. Now just like the brain, the spinal cord is going to have areas of gray matter and areas of white matter. So part of the spinal cord is going to be made up of myelinated axons and part of it is going to be made up of unmyelinated um, neuron parts and um, maybe even little interneurons. Okay, So the gray matter is going to contain the unmyelinated neuron parts, um, mostly cell bodies, dendrites, maybe some unmyelinated axons. Um, while the white matter is going to contain those myelinated axons. Now there are two grooves that run the length of the cord. There's one in front and one in back. The one in front is called the anterior or ventral median fissure and the one in back is called the posterior or the dorsal median sulcus. So clearly one of these is a little bit deeper than the other one and it's actually hard to tell uh, by looking at this picture because on this picture this is the back of the spinal cord and this is the front and if we look at the image it looks like the uh, back uh, division is deeper than the front but according to the naming protocol the fissure would be the deeper one and the sulcus would be the more shallow one so just kind of got to remember that Right through the middle of the cord is a uh, canal called the central canal 
and this is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. This structure, this opening is, is continuous with the fourth ventricle that's found um, anterior in, uh, to the hind brain, to the cerebellum um, up near the, up near the um, brain stem. So the central canal is right there in the center of that little hole. So in this image, uh, what we see here is the, uh, an enlargement of what we saw previously. Except we go ahead and give you the names, and we're going to go over all of these. We're going to give you the names of all these different regions. So here we have the posterior um, median sulcus and the anterior uh, median fissure right there. There's our central canal. And I'm going to start by naming this gray region right here. Now you notice there's a, a pochiati region here and another one off to the side and then one here in front. Each one of those is called a horn. So the gray matter has horns. It's the horn family. And the one here in the back is called the posterior horn. And the one off to the side here is called the lateral horn. And the one in front is named predictably the anterior horn. So that's how we would name these uh, gray matter regions within the, the cord. Now we also have these white matter regions. We have one in back, one off to the side, and one in front. But this is not a horn. This is, this is not the horn family. This is the column family. And predictably we can say we've got the posterior column, the lateral column, and the anterior column. So if it's gray matter, it's the horn family. If it's white matter, it is the column family. That's how I would remember that. Now, once the nerves branch off and leave the spinal column, they become part of the peripheral nervous system. So up to that point, they're considered part of the central nervous system. And when they exit, when the nerves are exiting, or I guess even entering, um, when they're in that transition area, they're going to be leaving between um, these open areas that are formed between the vertebra when the vertebra fit together to create the spinal column. And so at every level where two vertebra come together, we're going to see um, par a portion of the spinal column, the spinal cord, uh, exit and provide innerva innervation to the body parts in that area, or it's going to be tracking um, afferent nerves back into the spinal column at that level as well. So we can remember it's a two-way pathway um, because there's only so much space for uh, afferent nerves to come in and efferent nerves to go out. And they're going to they're going to use the same openings for that. So um, and they they tend to get uh, bound together at that level, even though they're exiting and entering, they're, they're, the, the nerves are carrying information. Uh, one nerve is carrying information into the spine, the other one is carrying it away. They tend to get bundled together as they travel through that, that foramen that is created by two vertebra coming together. And the way that the vertebra fit together, it actually creates the 31 pairs of spinal nerves that are um, having their uh, exit or entrance point to the spinal cord or the body. All right. So spinal nerves are just generally said to exit the cord anteriorly um, and that spinal nerves will enter the cord um, posteriorly. So this is their attachment to the cord proper. So what this is saying, and it'll make more sense when we take a look at the image in just a second, is that the uh, motor aspect of the nervous system, the, the nervous system carrying information out to the body, that's the efferent neurons, um, they are exiting the spinal cord on the front aspect of the cord, exiting out through the foramen. And then the, the afferent neurons are entering the cord, coming through the, the, the foramen, but then attaching to the spinal cord in the back. So we, uh, we enter information from the back and we exit through the front. So coming at you from the back and exiting through the front.
so we're back at this image again and remember this part is the anterior part of the spinal cord and back here is the posterior part and we don't see the bone around this but the the vertebra would come together roughly around in this area creating an opening where the nerves could make their exit or their entrance to communicate with the spinal cord so if we're talking about information coming into the spinal cord by way of an afferent neuron, it's going to be coming in this way, and its attachment is going to come in at the back. That is the afferent pathway. So it comes in, and it has an attachment to the back. So all of our sensory nerves come in and attach to the back. Now, once that input has been integrated and the brain has made a plan, it's going to send that plan out through the efferent pathways, the motor neurons, and they're going to exit from the front, go through the foramen, that would be roughly right in this area, and then go out to the body this way. Now, we notice this structure right here, this rounded structure right here. And if we look at the definition, it says it's a ganglion. So what's a ganglion? A ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies. It's a cluster of neuron cell bodies. And the thing that we have learned in theory class is that the sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system are those unipolar neurons. So where are the cell bodies for these neurons that are providing sensation for all of our body, all the body parts? real close to the spinal cord right there. So that means that if your arm, it, your fingers way out here, that neuron has to travel, that dendritic component really, has to travel up the neuro, up the arm and then over to the shoulder and then across the back and then the cell body for that neuron is going to be located right in there and then the axon is going to make a short trip to the spinal cord before it synapses with another neuron. So yes, the neurons of the unipolar afferent sensory neurons are located right there. Now, if you were to do a dissection and cut away all the bony covering of the spinal cord, you would notice a number of very interesting features about the spinal cord. A couple of things that you would notice is that there are areas where the spinal cord is kind of thickened. It just kind of bulges in a couple of areas. And so we have to ask ourselves what's going on there. Well, what's going on here is that we have a number of motor neurons that are uh, branching off from this area, providing for output to the muscles of the upper and lower limbs. So because we have so many neurons that can go to all the muscles of the arms and the muscles of the legs, they are going to have their starting point in the cervical region and in the lumbar region, and that creates an extra bit of bulk or mass in the cervical region and the lumbar region. Hence the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement. Now, previously on a slide, I talked about how the spinal cord stops at roughly the level of L1 or maybe L2. So then we have to ask ourselves what's going on beyond that. Well, I'm going to skip the conus medullaris, and I'm going to go right here to the cauda equina. Now, cauda means tail, and equina means horse. So at the tip, or at the end of the, the solid cord, the cord is going to become a series of strands of nerves. So before that, they were all bound together. And it's going to be the same nerves that were, were just up here at the level of uh, T12, maybe L1. Everything beyond that point is just going to be the individual nerves that are bundled together. And uh, the reason for this is because as we grow, the, the spinal cord has to grow with us. And we, there comes a point where we outpace the ability of the solid cord to grow. And so as we grow, 
uh, the cord doesn't uh, grow and remain solid, but the nerves will continue to elongate as the rest of us does, and it ends up uh, being just strands here in the lumbar region. So this, uh, these strands of neurons in the lumbar region uh, is what we call the cauda equina. Now at the tip of the solid part of the cord, it's going to taper down to a point. And so this is what we call the conus medullaris. So conus means it's cone-shaped. And um, uh, if you think about a waffle ice cream cone, it's got that uh, pointy part down at the end and then the enlarged parts where the ice cream goes. So it, that's kind of what it looks like. It's like a, like a waffle cone where it's got the enlargement here in the lumbar region and then it tapers down to a little point and then all of the, the strands of nerves uh, continue on as individual strands. So the conus medullaris gives way to the cauda equina. That's how we can um, put that together. Now I just recognized as I was doing this lecture that I've got cauda equina on here twice. So I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to correct that in my version because it'll mess up my, my little red pointer. All right, and then I do want to talk about this last thing, the phylum terminale. Now, in order to keep the spinal cord uh, situated properly inside of the spinal canal, we have to have an anchoring system for that. Because if we think about what's going on here, it, it, it comes out of the cranial vault and then it's housed within these loops of bone, a rather mobile structure our spinal column is. And then we have branches that are coming off at all of these different levels, 31 different levels. So how do we keep this thing anchored and keep it from, you know, move it up and down? Well, there is a, 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 a fibrous strand that is attached to the conus medullaris that goes all the way down and attaches to the coccyx. And this is known as the phylum terminale. So it's a fibrous extension of the conus medullaris that um, is covered with pia mater and it anchors the spinal cord within the spinal column.